Thanks for joining. There's a pretty good mix of folks in this room across kind of brand founders, uh, e-commerce infrastructure founders, B2B commerce, some stuff at Web3. Um, and thanks to Harley for joining us and kind of uh, entertaining a slew of questions from the group and some topics I prepared on this. I thought what would be interesting um, uh, to go into is really um, to start kind of thinking a little bit about how you approach entrepreneurship in general. I think Shopify is a you know, essentially a platform for enabling entrepreneurship and have always admired how steadfast in the mission you've been. Uh, and so I want to spend a few minutes on that, uh, talk more deeply about some of the stuff going on on platform and kind of efforts from the vantage point Shopify has, um, kind of what the future of commerce looks like from your, from your end. A big theme, it seems, through your life and career has been entrepreneurship and enabling it. Was there a moment in your life or when was the moment when you kind of decided that this was your calling, this is what you were going to dedicate your life to? A uh, quick show of hands, how many of you had sort of small little side hustle businesses when you were like eight to 10 years old in the room? Yeah, I mean, my people. Um, that, that was it, I mean, like growing up, um, I wasn't really into sports. I wasn't really into like, you know, I don't know, like hobbies in the way most kids were. I was kind of into this idea of like starting little businesses and, and I liked the idea of collecting, you know, sports cards, not because I thought it was cool to have like some like Michael Jordan rookie card. I thought it was cool to sell it for more money to my neighbor. Yep. I thought that was a great thing to hustle my neighbor into paying me all of his allowance. Um, my, my first real, I mean, some of you know this story, uh, but my first real kind of entrepreneurial thing was um, I was 13 years old. Um, I'm Jewish by background. I went to a lot of our mitzvahs, as I think a bunch of you did. Um, and I wanted to be a DJ. Nobody would hire me because I was like this big and didn't know how to DJ. And so uh, I started my own DJ company and hired myself. And I, after that, that year was the same year we moved from Canada to South Florida. And I, I ended up DJing like something in the neighborhood, no, no exaggeration, like, like 500 bar and bub mitzvahs. And while even in high school, all my friends were like going out, you know, getting drunk and, and doing whatever you do in high school, um, I was DJing bar mitzvahs, which at the time, like, Seem really cool now. I say it out loud. It seems super lame, but um, but that's kind of what I what I was into. I was into this idea of, and I, it wasn't even about the music or about like the entertainment. I just liked the idea that I was able to deliver some value and somebody would pay me for it. And I think a lot of it had to do with this idea of like independence, that I can do whatever I wanted because I was able to make my own living. Where this got really serious for me was in 2001. I moved from South Florida to Montreal to go to McGill. I was born in Montreal. It's my hometown. Um, went to McGill and things got really rough with my family. My dad was no longer around. Um, my, my mom and younger sisters had basically, there was no money. And so a friend of mine was at student council at McGill University and he told me that McGill at the time was spending some, somewhere in the neighborhood of $25,000 per semester on orientation or frosh apparel, the stuff you got the first day of school. Montreal, if, I don't know if any of you know about Montreal, but it has a rich history of the schmata business, the clothing business, kind of like New York City. And the reason is, in fact, if you, you can, it's a really interesting uh, um, thought, which is if you look at cities that, ha that have a disproportionate amount of immigrants, you will often see a massive textile trade, schmata trade, apparel trade, because the barrier to entry is very, very low. And I started selling t-shirts to McGill and then eventually sold to a lot of other universities across Canada. And Again, I wasn't really into t-shirts per se. I was into the fact that this tool called entrepreneurship that I pulled out of my pocket for DJing and also for apparel, it solved the problem. The problem when I was 13 was I wanted to DJ. No one would hire me. The problem when I was 17 or 18 was my mom and sisters needed money and I needed to pay tuition. I ended up moving to Ottawa in 2005 because a, good, a really good mentor of mine um, convinced me that law school would be like finishing school for entrepreneurship that I would learn certain skills and certain tools in sort of that, in that, in that three year period that would be very valuable to me as, a, as an aspiring, you know, bigger entrepreneur. Moved to Ottawa, had no friends or family there, I'd never even been to Ottawa before. And so like many of you, when many of you have moved to new cities, I'm certain I would ask where are the entrepreneurs, where do the entrepreneurs hang out, hang out? And I was directed to a small coffee shop in Ottawa and that's when I met Toby. And Toby had just moved to Canada um, a year or two earlier he met a girl, he was from Germany, he met a girl who lived in Canada, he moved there, couldn't get a job because he was a new immigrant. So like, you know, a good, uh, you know, aspiring entrepreneur, he started a company selling snowboards on the internet. And in 2004, there were really two ways to sell a product online. There was, you either use a marketplace or you paid a million dollars for some ridiculous, um, you know, IBM WebSphere stack. 
And so he was really into this, this new language called Ruby on Rails. He was a core developer with a few other people like DHH. And, and there were a few companies that were really thinking about, a few people in the world thinking about Ruby on Rails and how we would build scalable software at a much faster pace, and he was one of them. And so he wrote a piece of software to sell these snowboards and very quickly realized that other people may want to use the software uh, for their own products. And I was one of those people. I became one of the first merchants on Shopify. And I turned my sort of wholesale t-shirt business into a direct-to-consumer retail business. And I spent the rest of law school and business school selling t-shirts. Went to practice law for all of 10 months in, uh, in Toronto. Uh, Moise and I talked about this yesterday, like just the worst experience of my entire life. The law firm environment, you were a good lawyer, I think. Uh, I was a really, really bad lawyer. And I just, I hated the environment. I hated the fact that it wasn't about how much value you, you added. It was about who you were, who your last, what your last name was, how long you've been there. It just, it wasn't for me. And so I called Toby in 2009 and said, I would love to join you and a small group of others and help build this company called Shopify. And the fundamental reason for that was, I thought Shopify was the greatest catalyst I'd ever experienced as an entrepreneur. I, I talked about that tool I pulled out. Shopify, it felt like it gave me superpowers that I was able to use that tool called entrepreneurship and, and wrap it with this, this superpower and I can build things faster and at much higher, much larger scale. And you know, 13 years later, we have millions of stores on the platform. We've helped um, millions of stores start, scale, and grow their businesses. And uh, today we're about 10% of all e-commerce in the US and, and in other countries even, even higher than that. Yeah, amazing. I mean, I, I want to come back to your personal story. Um, a bit. I think one of the um, topics that I think a lot of people here are interested in that kind of ties to uh, the early vision for Shopify is the, the platform piece. Yes. And I think what's really notable, I mean, there's a bunch of people I'm looking at here in the room today who have built significant at scale businesses on the platform. Um, uh, Can you raise your hand if you built a at scale business on the platform? Yeah. Great. Yep. Cool. Um, Wonder who would be nice to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, just. Um, and. You know, I, I imagine early on just the builder mentality, um, uh, kind of Toby, all you guys thinking about just kind of building as full of a solution as you can for, found, for entrepreneurs who wanted to get going. When did it become clear that the platform approach, approach was the right one? And what were some of kind of the assumptions that you made kind of going into that? In the early days of Shopify, we used to get this report from um, our support team of three, would send us this report, I think every Thursday or Friday. And it was basically a list of customer complaints that they had or, um, voids in the product, uh, things that were lacking in, in, the, in the product. And at a certain point, that list got longer and longer. And I think most entrepreneurs and most founders would, would have had this experience. You have to make a decision. Either you're going to build everything, or you're going to need to find another way to supplement the, the platform's lack of, you know, the lack of product market fit that 100% of merchants are going to get. Mm -hmm. And so there was no way that we would ever been able to build every single feature request that was coming out of the support organization. And so it felt like the easiest thing to do would be, well, why don't we just create a bunch of APIs and let third parties come and build on top of it? The problem was that none of you in this room wanted to build on Shopify in those days because you have a classic problem, which is chicken and egg. And you're not going to build unless we have a lot of merchants. And we're not going to get a lot of merchants unless you actually build to fill in the product gaps. I remember when we launched the theme store, um, Daniela reminded me of the story earlier today. We launched a theme store. No one wants to build themes for, the sh for Shopify because, again, why would you spend any time building for a platform that has very few customers of your product? And so we created a competition. We gave a, an iPod Touch um, to the winner. And recently on Twitter, the person that won found me and said, I still have the iPod Touch. And it says, like, you know, theme store winner, whatever it was, um, theme store uh, design winner. So we did a lot of things in the early days that things that just didn't simply scale. We, like, I would call app developers uh, myself and say, look, like, I know you're building for force.com or some big enterprise e-commerce company. I think you should build for Shopify. One of the cool parts of, of, of building for Shopify in like 2010 is there's, there's nobody else. We had such a small group of app develop developers that if you build something of actual value, and you believe that our ability to scale the platform in terms of get more merchants on is going to continue and it's going to grow, you will be like part of the furniture of, this, of the app, app Store program. And, and over time, it got, it got better and better. What we started realizing was anyone that was really good at but, but thinking about um, commerce and, 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 and sort of modern retail, we were giving them an opportunity to find as many customers as they wanted for their, 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 their app. So effectively, we would become their, their go-to-market strategy. And in return, 
Shopify would provide 100% product market fit for anyone that used the platform, regardless of what were the nuances of their particular business. There was an early, remember there was an early story of, um, of a merchant on Shopify who was a European sneaker company who badly needed some sort of like sh uh, uh, shoe size converter. And they were adamant that we should build it ourselves. And like, it was obvious, it was like the worst thing we could have spent our time working on is like building some sort of like, you know, shoe size converter. And I remember having this conversation myself with this, with this merchant. And eventually, um, it turned out there were these, there were a bunch of third party app developers in Europe, um, I think actually in, the UK, in, in London at the time, who had just bought, built a bunch of these sort of like free tools online, like just like a website where you put in like your US shoe, shoe size and you got the American, or you got the European shoe size. And we just contacted them and say, look, take, your, take everything you've built for the web and just put it into the app store. And, and eventually as they did and others did it, we actually, we built a real app program. And then over time as, the merchant base grew and we got you know, 5,000 merchants and 10,000 merchants and 100,000 merchants. It became a lot easier to recruit more app developers. I think the key though um, for us has been, um, many of you have heard, if, if, if you've listened to anything I've ever said, I talk a lot about this, but like that Bill Gates line, to create a real platform is where you create more value for others and you capture for yourself. The thing that, that Bill Gates line, quote unquote, I think it's called the Bill Gates line, um, he certainly has owned that sentence, but the thing that that's missing is, the next sentence is, and over time, the proportion of value should continue to grow on the side of the, of the partner. And I think we've done, we've added a lot more to the core offering of Shopify. The definition of what most merchants need most of the time is what we built into core. But even if we build something like, you know, email marketing ourselves, we still leave room for Clavio and all these other email marketing companies to make lots of money to deliver, to create great value for our merchants. And I think that relationship we've had with the, with the, merchant, with the merchant community and then the, the partner community over time um, is, is something that I think is, is really quite unique. And part of it is because we've always left room for others to participate in sort of the Shopify economy. Yeah, it's an, it feels like with scale, um, the, the needs of merchants, of developer partners and of Shopify have the potential to conflict like, you know, more often or in more interesting like ways. Are there, um, I guess, are there, op are there instances where you feel like you maybe um, provided a suboptimal merchant experience, unintentionally suboptimal merchant experience by kind of um, having a partner kind of serve that need versus Shopify having done it? Or how, are there instances where kind of these, this balance has been hard to, hard to strike? Yeah, I mean, in the early days of Shopify, we had, we had third party app developers that were basically doing um, mobile web optimizations of an online store. Yeah. Um, we saw, this is like 2012 or 2013, but what you saw was the traffic on the mobile web was increasing. This is not mobile apps, mo the mobile web browser. Traffic was increasing. Transactions were not at this point. I mean, it, it was still pretty much like a way to browse, not a way to transact. I mean, it was, it was years later where you saw more than 50% of transactions on Shopify were completed on a mobile device. but. Um, and we had a bunch of these third-party apps that their only value was they would take your online store on a desktop and optimize it for the mobile web. And it, that felt at a, certain, at a certain point where we saw more and more traffic going, okay, this has now crossed the sh threshold, and, and now it is what most people need most of the time. And so we, we built that ourselves. Um, so there's going to be times where, and we've been honest about that to say, like, that definition is dynamic, it's going to change. The trends in commerce and retail are going to change. So there's gonna be times where we're gonna add new products, new features. The best app developers that have been on the platform, in some cases since day one, they've always found opportunities to add more value. There's always surface area around. And um, I, every now and then I run into an app developer that, that sort of criticizes us and says, well, you're building everything yourself. And, and I direct them to like 8,000 apps in the app store, some of which, by the way, I mean, we talk a lot about like these IPOs that have happened on Shopify from the merchant perspective, whether it's Oatly or it's Allbirds or it's Figs. My suspicion is we're going to have a lot more app developers that businesses that were predominantly built on the Shopify API that will go public. And that'll be as, as an exciting of a day for us as any of the merchants that have gone public. Yeah. I think, um, you know, one, one of the areas that I think is most kind of, that I hear most chatter around in talking with merchants now, and this is kind of ties to my previous background running at scale paid marketing budgets, is just the 
cost of acquisition going up uh, for a variety of reasons, but with ATT um, and with iOS measurement challenges, it seems to be more pronounced than ever. Um, at the same time, I've heard kind of Toby and, and you state early on kind of playing Kingmaker is not what Shopify does, kind of never pit up one merchant against another, which kind of ties into how one might, you're probably sick of getting asked the question, will Shopify become a marketplace? But I think on, on audiences, this has been a really interesting kind of effort to watch because it feels like merchants love this. Um, how have you guys thought about building out what is essentially kind of perhaps a competitor to Facebook lookalike audiences or maybe a supplement way for, uh, for merchants to really drive traffic? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's fundamentally not a competitor because, I mean, Facebook lookalike audiences was fundamentally a set of third-party data that is, it contributes a bunch of some of the stuff that Apple's, Apple's putting out in the world. Whereas, so let me answer, I'll answer directly. Um, the reason that audiences is opt-in is because we don't want to default everyone to share their data. There's going to be merchants on the platform that are, is going to say, fundamentally, I don't want to share my information with anybody else. However, one of the things that audiences is doing, uh, you guys know what audiences is? OK, most people do. For those that, that don't, if you're a Shopify Plus merchant and you have 10 SKUs, you pick three SKUs you want to sell more of, you put them into the audience algorithm, we feed you back with a lookalike audience or a sample audience. And now when you're buying ads on Facebook or Google or Instagram, when you upload your product descriptions and your metadata and your, your photography of the product, you also upload this, this sample audience. And, and we can pretty much guarantee you will have a higher return on ad spend from that. So it's opt-in. You don't have to do it. One of the things we're realizing is, and, and we're, we're talking a lot more about audiences now because now we're seeing it, it's beginning to scale really well. The more people that opt into it, the richer the algorithm becomes, the more information we have, the better we can help you make decisions. And so I think that two things are happening. One is merchants that may be hesitant to share all their data are becoming a little more comfortable with it when they realize, one, it's anonymized data, and two, Modern retail is not zero sum, it's positive sum. That there's so much business out there that it's okay for you to participate in this because yes, you, you may be making another merchant you know, somewhere else in a different category a little bit more money, but you're also fundamentally making yourself more money as well. And the delta between you being somewhat uncomfortable but sharing is offset by your return on ad spend. And over time we think that we wanna get, we wanna get audiences to a point where it is a bad Thing. It, it, is, it is a mistake to buy ads on a particular digital surface, digital network, without actually first running your products through the audiences. We're not there yet, but, but that's where we want to get to. Um, and we're not a marketplace, by the way, just answer that, that first question <laughs> very directly. But that is something we can do. And, and, but the reason it's opt-in is because you don't have to participate in it. One of the things you get, when you sell a product on a marketplace, you get to borrow the economies of scale from the marketplace, and they charge you rent for that in the form of like listing fees, but also transaction fees. When you build a, a tech stack, a custom tech stack for your brand, you get, you, you get full ownership, you get full independence. What we're trying to give you with Shopify is you get both. You get economies of scale because you are part of a community that is the second largest online retailer in America. And at the same time, you get full independence. We don't own your business, we don't own your customers, we don't own your data, it all belongs to you. Our job is to be good custodians of all those things so you can make better decisions. But if you decide you want to leave Shopify and you want to take all your customer data with you, you should do that. Um, we hope you don't, but that, 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 that's the role we want to play. And I think one of the reasons that there are people in this room that have said to me in the last two hours, I've been a shareholder of Shopify for, you know, since, since, since day one, since the IPO, most people in the world don't really know Shopify because fundamentally we've been the brand behind the brand. The only thing that's changed recently is ShopPay. ShopPay has now put the Shopify business front and center in a way that just had not happened before. And so, you know, random New York person that's walking in the street right now, he or she is now seeing Shopify, the ShopPay button, across most of their favorite stores. Now they're beginning to be like, what is the shop pay? What's by Shopify? But for the most part, we've, and this is a very, I think this is where being based in Canada has been quite helpful. We have played really nicely and, and had, we've been in a good position being the brand behind the brand and letting our merchants look really good, not us. Yep. So we're talking about some of the at scale stuff around audiences. If I go back to the beginning and think about what is the core competency of a merchant early on or as a brand founder trying to get started, in my view, like, the art is around finding your initial kind of audience, your initial 1,000 fans, if you will. Um, what, like, 
as you think about removing a lot of the other competencies that a merchant would have had to need to build in-house over time um, and replacing those or kind of supplementing them with Shopify and its partner mm -hmm. ecosystem, how do you think about the role you play in that core and that initial kind of discovering those fans? Would you say that is still ultimately on, on kind of the, the brand founder to, to kind of figure out? Yeah, I mean, there's some things we do to sort of help them get found. I mean, yeah. like, it's funny, um, we all sort of take this for granted now, but like, out of the box for $29, the SEO that you get with Shopify is equivalent to what someone was paying millions of dollars for eight years ago, five years ago even. So we, we try to make it really easy, but ultimately we don't do manufacturing for our merchants. It's up to them making the products. Um, that, that's up to them. And we don't give them customers. We just, we don't hand it to them. Now, if they want to be given customers, it is a much better, a much better version of that business model is a marketplace. They will give you those customers. I think what people miss about the marketplace model is those are not your customers. You are renting customers from that marketplace. They belong to them and they will rent it to you until they decide they don't want to rent it to you anymore. But you are not actually building any direct relationships. And so um, your ability to build a brand, build an audience is up to you. What we're trying to do is find all the ways we can make it easier, whether that's through audiences, through SEO, or it's even through things that are simple like in the admin, when you're looking at your analytics and your reporting dashboard, and it says, you are getting really high quality traffic from Pinterest randomly, you should go and buy Pinterest ads. Or you are getting incredible, um, the, your best customers are coming from this geography, you should go buy ads in this particular geography. And so we try to like, rather than give them the fish, we try to like teach them how to fish so they can feed themselves for a lifetime. And not everyone likes it. Some people want to be given the fish and that's just not, that's not our model. One of the questions we were talking about um, before this dinner was around kind of the tension between serving early stage entrepreneurs, upstarts, uh, while also trying to scale an enterprise business. And I think that's something that, as I was kind of asking for feedback on questions before, and I think it's a topic that a lot of founders in this room struggle with. How have you thought about it? I know Plus has kind of been partitioned off, and there, there's kind of different ways you all have approached this. Like how, um, what generalizable advice would you have for founders that are kind of trying to serve both ends of the spectrum? That is one of the most difficult things for a, a piece of software or frankly a company to do. I mean, we're in this beautiful restaurant and, and we're enjoying this food, and, and I don't know who owns this restaurant, but presumably at some point, someone had a conversation about making the restaurant bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually there's a certain point where you're going to get diminishing marginal returns on the restaurant size versus quality of the food, the quality of the service. Software is a bit different because software should fun fundamentally scale. It should make it easier for people of all sizes to use. But the problem is that um, years ago we had a bunch of competitors in sort of that SMB space. I don't think any of them exist anymore. Um, some of them do, but most of them don't exist anymore. There were all these SMB companies e-commerce companies, and almost every single one of them, to a T, all moved up market. Every one of them. Big commerce even decided like somehow a year ago that that's where they should be going. Everyone moved up market because one up market, you have higher uh, customer lifetime value, you have, the, the, the cost of acquisition is almost the same in many cases, but higher lifetime value, and the churn is much lower. So what happened is you went from having a funnel that looked like this to a funnel that looked like this but the quality of those, of those merchants were much larger. And so they, they all moved up market to do that and they all struggled. The reason they struggled was because what they missed was that the brands that we love today, are, like most of the brands we love today, our favorite brands, they started just a few years ago on Shopify at their mom's kitchen table. And if you don't help those people that are at their mom's kitchen table get started and make it really easy, and then once they get bigger and once they scale, you need the complexity to reveal itself over, over time. So what I mean by that is not everyone needs, like when people are getting started, nobody needs cross-border task compliance. When people are getting started, nobody needs to do ridiculous like ERP integrations. But there's gonna be a point where they need that. And when they need that, the, that has to reveal itself. And so one of, the, like, one of the most challenging parts of Shopify is to make software that is so easy to use that anyone at their mom's kitchen table can get started in a couple of hours and build a beautiful independent um, scalable online store, but when they, when they grow and they become larger companies, they can upgrade and they can take more merchant solutions, payments, capital, shipping, they can add balance, they can start selling cross-market with either Shopify markets or even our partners at Globally, maybe they add shop pay installments, but all these things reveal itself to them at the right time. 
And that's the reason why you see on Shopify, not only do we have these small little entrepreneurial like startups, like aspiring entrepreneurs who just had a story in the, in the shower in the morning, but we also have these massive multi-billion dollar companies. And the ones we like to talk about the most are the ones that have gone from kind of that you know, first sale to that to full scale. Um, but that is really one of the most challenging parts because at some point, every aspect, every segment, every cohort of merchants is going to say, I want way more of this stuff also. And you have to do it in a way that is scalable, that is easy to use, but it doesn't overwhelm them at, at any stage. It's one of the reasons why we think shipping is really important. We didn't really like the shipping logistics industry is difficult. One of the reasons that we think it was important for us to actually tackle that with SFN was because it felt like it was one of those areas where there was a natural exit, like off ramp out of entrepreneurship. You got big enough where now you need to do, deal, with, do, deal with, excuse me, a 3PL or you have to deal with like some massive company who's doing shipping on your behalf. It gets really challenging. And so what we're trying to do is because now, again, if you were to pretend that we were a retailer, single retail, we'd be the second largest retailer, online retailer in America. We're trying to use our economy of scale across every single problem point for an entrepreneur and for a business and for a brand to reduce that, that barrier to success. And, um, and doing so at the right time with the right set of features, but then also having things like hydrogen, which is our, um, our, our, our version of headless, that is, you don't see many companies that stretch. You just let's take a, sp a simple example, email marketing. Most people use email, this is pretty much across the board. Most people start with the BCC line for email marketing. And then they move to some sort of free, you know, free version. They use on some Gmail like widget or, or app or plugin. And then eventually they move to like, you know, MailChimp, and then maybe with constant contact, and eventually they get to like exact target, and then eventually it's like some like massive enterprise Oracle SAP type email system. There is a natural graduation as you scale, which means you keep migrating from, from, from platform to platform as you grow. The fact that that doesn't happen on our platform is, is one of the things that I, I'm most proud of. Yeah. I mean, you, it's, I'm glad you mentioned fulfillment because this also feels like an area that um, is not obvious from a cultural DNA standpoint, or just from a DNA and kind of company's core competency, um, going from kind of bits to atoms, thinking about do you acquire into that, what do you build in-house? Like, what, when was the moment you, you articulated why it was important to do that as you thought about different ways to get into it to avoid distracting from your core? Yeah. How did you guys make that decision? So um, a couple things on, on sort of fulfillment. The first thing is no one really loves this fulfillment side of their business. No one's in love with it. I mean, even the people that are the most operationally excellent founders and, 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 and leaders I know still don't love that aspect of the business. And the companies that we all believe do it well, they were kind of forced to do it really well because they had no choice. Consumers have been completely recalibrated in terms of expectation. Um, I actually don't think consumers need one day shipping, just to be clear. I think what consumers deeply need and, and have come to expect is the anticipation, the approximate anticipation of when my package is going to arrive. That is what matters most. And it's almost impossible for small businesses and even medium sized businesses to do that. Even some very large companies that many of us shop from don't tell you when your package is going to arrive. They sort of give you a, a five-day window. I mean, it, that, that is not what consumers want. They want to understand when it's coming. So when we looked at sort of the fulfillment space, it felt like there were sort of three blocks of fulfillment. The first block is from the, the manufacturer, from the factory where you make it, to the port. And we were watching what Ryan was doing, and now Dave Clark is doing at Flexport for a long time. And frankly, it felt like they were taking a very modern, very scalable approach to a really difficult problem. Um, and so we decided for that first phase from factory to port, Flexport would be a great partner for us. We should, we should build deep integration so people can track that first phase. The second phase is when it gets to the port. How does it go from the port to the fulfillment center? And um, most people refer to that phase as, as the balancing phase. You have to balance your inventory. And we were actually gonna build software ourselves. We'd started building software ourselves. We had bought a company a couple years ago called Six River System. Uh, they were formerly the guys from Kiva. Amazon bought Kiva and, and didn't, you know, they, they all left, they started 6RS. We saw what they were doing with these sort of, um, what they call Chucks, which is their robotics company. And the Chucks are really, they're, they're a really wonderful way to make pretty much any warehouse, any fulfillment center more efficient. So, Using, uh, like along with 6RS, we were gonna build that balancing software. And then we began to ask merchants what they thought about it, who they were using, and it was obvious that all 
sort of roads are pointing to this company called Deliver. And, and, and do you guys know Harish from Deliver? Some of you do. And Harish and his team had simply built something that was just unequivocally better than everybody else. And every merchant that was using Deliver for any part of their business, whether it was cross stock or it was balancing, was delighted by it. Like, imagine that, being delighted by your balancing software. So in that case, it was obvious that, that if we had an opportunity to acquire Deliver, we should. And we had an opportunity a couple months ago, and so we acquired them. And so that second sort of phase is really powered by Deliver. And the final phase is, OK, now that you know exactly, now it's in the fulfillment warehouse, how do you get it from the fulfillment warehouse to the actual end consumer? So um, kind of like, you know, right to their, their, like the person who bought it, right to them. And it turned out that there were all these warehousing, warehouses, or 3PLs, all over the US that were half empty, were not really you know, operationally efficient, did not have robotics, did not have good software. And so when we began to sort of talk about this idea of like what we call SFN, the Shopify Fulfillment Network, all of these warehouses started contacting us and saying, hey, look, we have excess space. We were doing, we were doing fulfillment for Forever 21 or for Barney's or for, you know, I don't know, online for Neiman Marcus before bankruptcy. And we have, we have capacity. We, will, we can handle all of your, like any of your merchants that want to use our warehouses, we can do so. And so we, we started building uh, FMS software, fulfillment management software, and we said to all these sort of, you know, these independent uh, warehouses, if you integrate with our software, if you're ambitious, you should also integrate with the Chucks, the Six River System robots. We will make you part of this network, and you basically will never have to look for a customer for your warehouse ever again. And so, whether it's from you know from the manufacturer to the port, or from port right to the end porch, um, there are pieces of that that we felt we had to own, and there were pieces where there were just people that were doing it better, faster, more efficient than we were, like Harish. Um, and we don't really need to spend $10 billion because that's not our model. Our model is asset light software first. We don't think any of our merchants require one day delivery. If they do, they can, you know, they can, talk, they can figure it out on their own. What they really want is to be able to offer a proper expected delivery date to their consumers. And what we think is really cool about delivery and fulfillment sort of as a whole is that by doing so, we think that actually we will give small businesses and, and smaller brands a fighting chance against the bigger companies because this idea of, of being able to anticipate when your order is coming is massive, not just for trust, but actual for business. Like it does change the conversion rates. So that's why we're doing it. Yeah. Um, this kind of ties to a point on future proofing. I think one of the uh, things I've heard you articulate that I love is one role of Shopify is helping merchants essentially future proof their business. And so I wanted to shift gears to talking about kind of what the next decade plus of e-commerce looks like. I think you are in a really unique vantage point on basically the best vantage point probably on seeing what, where things might be going. Uh, there's a bunch of trends right now that myself, others in this room are spending time on around whether it be live video, creator-led commerce, wallet-aware, token-gated commerce, other things in messaging. I guess if you look across everything that's going on on kind of the next gen or future of commerce, if you will, like what gets you most excited right now? Um, I think retail and commerce kind of go in waves. Like there was like a wave of like everyone wanted like crazy personalization. I remember talking to like some brands here in, in New York, like Kith, for example, and they were like they wanted to like do the whole initials on your shoes or on your sweatshirt. Or um, I walked in today to you guys know Saturdays, great yeah. brand out of here, Shopify store, both online and offline. They had an embroidery set up in the back. Um, so like I was like, what's that for? Well, you can personalize your shirt. Like there was sort of an era of like personalization that was everywhere. And then there was sort of like an era of like drop shipping. And then there was an era of, um, you know, subscriptions. Like every company did a subscription. They're, like you can use subscriptions on like winter coats as if like anyone needs that. Um, there was an era where every single physical retailer, I kid you not, had a DJ in, in there. Everyone had it. It didn't even, it wasn't even on brand. It was like they're selling like, like asparagus and like they have a DJ in the back. And so all of these things, I think, for some merchants, some of the time, these make, this makes a lot of sense. But not everyone needs a DJ, not everyone needs personalization, not everyone needs subscription. The way that we think about all these things, uh, I'll, go, I'll go specific yeah. on my own opinion in a second, but as a whole is make it so that when you come to Shopify, we make the important things really, really easy. Checkout, inventory, ability to transact, um, beautiful storefront, fast. If you have a massive flash sale because you got Jerry Seinfeld and Kit together, which I think is like the greatest yes. collaboration ever. Um, that you can handle any traffic spikes. That's the important stuff. We make that really easy. But then we also make everything else possible. 
And the reason I'm talking so much about future proofing is because there is no way for any brand that you've invested in, and you've invested, I know, in some of the best brands on the planet, there's no way for them to anticipate exactly where commerce is going. But the key is to find something that, that, that doesn't require you to ever have to migrate off of it. And if you look at a lot of the enterprise companies, enterprise e-commerce companies, I think all of them have been acquired by some big software company. Um, that's not how they're building it. It's not that they're bad or good, it's just they've built it in a certain way which is highly specific for a, a, a particular type of customer. My personal opinion is that a lot of these very large companies are beginning to also act very much more entrepreneurial. They don't want to have eight month sales cycles and three month RFPs. They want something that's really, really great and they want to know fundamentally that the platform they're choosing today is future-proofed. One of the things I think is really cool is, on a personal level, is I think this whole like channel conflict, omni-channel stuff is going away. I think like we have got, we've, we've now gone past it. Every modern brand, every brand that we love doesn't really care where you buy from. They just want you to have a great experience. And I think even the term omni-channel will eventually, like in the next 12 months, will be like talking about the color TV. You just don't say that because every TV is fundamentally color TV. And I think that's where it's going. I think that's where omni-channel is going, where it just, it just doesn't matter how you sell. It is, it is the modern day town square and it's digital and it's in person and it's, and I think actually that may not be like the sexiest thing. We can talk about NFTs or Web3 if you want also. It's probably far sexier to talk about. But like that actually is the best version of retail I think of the last 50 years. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm others in this room now. I'm very excited about wholesale and like the opportunity to actually help brands. Wholesale is not sexy. Yeah. Wholesale is pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. If you can do wholesale from Shopify, yeah. means um, I started a little side hustle during the pandemic called uh, Firebelly Tea, and part of it was um, I I was drinking way too much coffee and I have anxiety, so coffee in the afternoon for me is like a really bad idea. As you can tell, I'm kind of hyper anyway. Um, so I started drinking really good tea, and my, my, one of my best friends is David Siegel from David's Tea, and he started curating really good tea for me, like the best green tea. And so eventually, we decided we'd actually set up a store, and I wanted to try all the new Shopify products. We set it up, and so we, like, it's beautiful. We run it from, our, from the Shopify app. It's, it's an incredible experience. But we just got, um, we got a note from Essence. You guys know Essence? Really amazing store. They're like, we want to carry uh, Firebelly Tea. And so we have to have a whole different system for it, and the fact that now Shopify is B2B means I can run everything from Shopify. And whether it's wholesale, it's on Instagram, it's on TikTok, if I start producing music, it's gonna be on Spotify. It doesn't matter where the sale is made, there is one central nervous system for my entire business. And I think that's what people are looking for. Forget all the bells and whistles, like maybe we do a token gated NFT for tea at some point, but the fact that I can do it and not have to worry about will my platform support it, that is the key ingredient. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, and it sounds like you're seeing this anecdotally too, but like it, it seems like the, um, uh, merchants start considering going kind of to physical retail either via their own shops or via wholesale much sooner than in the past. I think one of the catalysts could be cost of traffic increasing or you know whatever or B2B kind of infrastructure getting better through Shopify and others. Because you're not um, saying because yeah. no one's walking around saying oh I'm a I'm a online only merchant or I'm an offline or I'm a wholesale merchant or I'm a wholesale brand. It just doesn't happen. We are actually seeing now on Shopify manufacturing companies that traditionally manufactured for other brands that are actually signing up for Shopify and creating a random brand from scratch. So even manufacturers are, are going direct to consumer now. This sort of this sort of weird um, separation and these these different categor categories of, of retail, it's all kind of breaking down. And I think ultimately it's going to be a very exciting time for retail in the next decade. Yeah. I guess one, one way to distill kind of the question around this topic is like if you if you look at the share of activity or the share of transactions that happen through a brand's website um, versus other channels. It sounds to me like you think that's going to look like the website will probably be less of a kind of factor long term. I think the website still, share going? I, I think website will still be very prominent. I think that uh, like until browsers become less less relevant in our day to day lives, which I don't think will be the case, I think the primary channel will be the online store. Yep. But I think everything kind of feeds into that. Whereas I think if you go back even 10 years ago, e-commerce was still big 10 years ago, the primary channel was the offline store. Yep. One of the last areas I wanted to ask you about on this, I know we're kind of getting up against time, but um, is creator-led commerce, and I, I think um, to me it feels like you know the next uh, crop of brands are creators or content creators, and you have some of the more notable ones, whether it be Mr. Beast or Kim K, et cetera, but there's also seems to be much of a kind of a torso and kind of longer tail of, of kind of content creators that are becoming brands enabled by Shopify and others. Um, you built collabs, there's, there's other stuff going on. Like, I guess, what, what is the role uh, you think Shopify should play in all of this? Whether it be helping brands, helping creators kind of become their brands or helping existing brands sell through creators? Like, what's, yeah. what does your activity there look like? I think there's, like, um, 
they were sort of like the drop shipping era like three or four years ago. You guys probably remember this. Um, we, had, we had acquired a company called Oberlo. Do you, do you remember that, Oberlo? Yeah. Yep. Um, and so drop shipping was like, you know, like all the rage for like, I don't know, 18 months or 20 months or so. And every time I went to a conference, whether it was a, a retail conference or an investor conference on Wall Street, there was sort of this like judgment on like drop shippers. Like dr drop shippers were not a real business. And, and they would reference the fact that the profit margins were so damn low and like they were here today on tomorrow. And, and I actually think that was like, they totally missed the point on drop shippers. Drop shippers and drop shipping as a business model, it was, it was a, a gateway drug to entrepreneurship. It meant if you had a blog, a travel blog, that you can sell maps if you wanted in a risk-free way. If you had a soccer blog, you talked about like, you know, the Champions League, you can try your hand at selling like actual soccer balls in, in, in a risk-free way. It was a process improvement on retail. And if eventually you sold enough soccer balls, you probably went and bought inventory yourself. Part of what we're trying to do across, whether it was years ago with drop shipping or even today with some of the more creator stuff, is make it really easy to try your hand at these things. But there's going to be a, a, a set, a meaningful set of, of content creators who have incredible audiences, who have massive subscriptions in terms of like on YouTube, they have a lot of subscribers, and they want to build a brand, but they just don't, they don't know how to or they're just not good at it. On the other side, you have all these amazing brands that are amazing at building a brand and a product that are trying to build YouTube channels and trying to build content, and they're just not that great at it either. And right now, it's this ridiculous maze of complexity to try to connect really good brands with like relevant content creators that are sort of in their vicinity, in their vertical. And so we had acquired a company called Dovetail uh, a little while ago. Some of you, I think, probably know Dovetail. And they were kind of doing something like this. And so what we did is we, we, we spent some time, did some work on it, and actually created Shopify Collabs, which is effectively an algorithmic matchmaking service to connect great brands with relevant content creators. And so the content creators are able to, like, the content creators, that, that industry is a $100 billion industry. $100 billion. 4% participation rate. If you increase that by another 4%, you change the lives of millions of people in every community, in every country, but only 4% participate. We, I love Feastables. I love Feastables as a concept. I love Feastables as a product. My, I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old. My six-year-old loves Mr. Beats videos. Um, maybe she shouldn't be watching, but she does. Um, the Feastable branding is great. The product is great. The delivery of it, it's, it's perfect. But not everyone is Mr. Beast. And so what we're trying to do is make it so that more content creators can actually monetize their audience and more brands can connect with that, that audience as well and do so in a way that actually it's simple, it's convenient, and if they decide eventually that they're gonna hire or they're gonna partner with the content creator long term, make them a co-founder, which we've already seen a little bit of already, that's cool. But just like everything else we've done, our job is to be facilitators of commerce and retail and entrepreneurship, and right now it feels like there's a huge opportunity connecting this group here with that group there, and, and they're just not talking to each other yet. Yeah. Um, so much to dive into on this. I, th I think I want to open it up to q and I think the last question, um, which comes back to the beginning and your story with Shopify, uh, that I want to ask on behalf of founders in the room who are, you know, I think universally the number one kind of issue in building companies is talent, both developing um, and recruiting. Yeah. I think it's rare, frankly, to see an exec who joins so early as you kind of scale throughout every juncture of the company and continue to be, you know, uh, just where you are. I think for, for other founders out there who might be seeking their Harley, I guess what, uh, what, what advice might you have um, and how, how should kind of founders, specifically earlier stage ones like when Toby brought you on, think about bringing on, you know, someone like yourself? You know, uh, Toby is well known for a lot of things. He's a product genius. He's one of the smartest humans I've ever met in my life and, and I will, I will I'll work for him as long as he'll have me. Um, that's, he's just, he's that good. Um, and he thinks about like, we're all here having dinner and, and like having good wine. Like he's right now at home thinking about Shopify and the product. I mean, that's, that's his ground state. That's what he thinks been the shower. And so, but one thing that doesn't get talked about enough about him is that he is one of the most self-aware humans I've ever met. And the reason I bring that up is because he has a clear view of not only what is he good at and what is he, like where, what can he be world class at, but also things that he just doesn't want to do or doesn't like to do. And so, even early on, he identified certain parts of the company that he just wasn't going to work on. And he made, um, he certainly took a bet on me, he saw some potential in me, 
One thing that, that founders and entrepreneurs don't talk about is when to leave a company. There is a right time to leave a company also, and you should make it as easy of an off-ramp as you once did on the on-ramp. You spend all this time bringing people on, like you give them these great you know, onboarding kits, and you send them great emails, and they come in, you're like, this is gonna be amazing, like, like LFG. But if you, if you create an environment, a culture, where it's just as easy to leave if it's the right time, you actually are able to offboard people in a much more effective way. Now there's also, like there's a zero to one, there's a one to N. And different parts of Shopify are in different stages. Like SFN and fulfillment or, or audiences is very much in that zero to one land right now. Payments has like a penetration, I think of like 85% in the US. That is very much one to N. That's a scale company. And you may need different leaders, different times, for different products. And so going back to like my point about Toby is, we're about 10,000 people at Shopify and he is incredibly self-aware about himself and because he's self-aware about what he's good at, what he's not good at, he's created a culture where all of us are very honest about this is not what I'm good at, but this thing, I think I can be a world-class storyteller. And so I'm gonna really focus on making sure, this is sort of what I am focusing on, making sure the entire world, investors, partners, merchants, the public, media, knows that Shopify wants to become the entrepreneurship company and we're the best place to build a business. Um, and there's been times where I've, you know, I, I ran Plus, and I ran the app store, and it's, at a certain point, it got to a point where I was the wrong person to run it. I wasn't good enough for it anymore. It deserved someone better. And so I raised my hand and said, I think we need to bring in someone who's better, faster, smarter than me for this area of the business. Because that other area, I think one day, and I'm, not, I'm certainly not there yet, I can be the best in the world at this thing. And I think that, that is a really helpful cultural philosophy to have at any company of any size. Awesome. Well, phenomenal set of insights. Let's thank Harley for spending the time with us today.